So, uh, I'd like to move on now to the next uh, panel. And as I do so, I, I want to say one of the great privileges I had when I worked in the role of, as the Regina Regional Intersectoral Committee Coordinator was to work very, very closely with Chief Cal Johnson. He was the chair of our committee at that time. And uh, the work that you gentlemen do uh, leading in the area that you do is not uh, easy work. And folks who do it as well as I know the two of you do from reading your bios, you bring a very unique uh, set of characteristics and a broad and open mind uh, that people don't always anticipate or expect to find uh, given what they assume of people in the policing field. And uh, it, it certainly for me was a, just a great experience. I learned so much from Cal and I look forward this morning uh, from learning, to learning from the both of you. So without any more from me, John Carnican and uh, Chief Dale McPhee. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to try and, and well, I, I'm not going to try, I can actually step off the stage, but when I step off the stage, you need to tell me, I, I, I don't like standing around, I like to move around. I've been a police officer for 38 years, mostly in Glasgow, and we're not armed, so being able to move around has always been a real asset. So if, um, so if I'm down here and moving around, you can still, yeah, is this okay for everybody? Please say it's okay, thank you. Yeah, super. Um, it's, it's great to be here, um, although as a, as a West of Scotland male, I'm at an age when it's statistically great to be anywhere, because um, our guys die very young. Um, so there's a couple of things I just want to do to set the scene. Um, the first is those more astute members of the audience will note that I have an accent. Um, I, I only acknowledge that as a fact. I, I am certainly not apologizing for it. I'm very happy with my accent. But what tends to happen is, as I go through this, I'll get a little excited. And it'll get a little quicker. And before you know it, it may even be Gallic. So what you have to do is, if I'm getting a little quick, just do this and I'll, I'll slow it down again. I try my best, but it's, it's, really, it's really difficult. The other thing I should say is that I have a mentor called David Alexander, who's now CB, who's now 82. He's a retired Major General from the Royal Marines. And he used to say, and still does, there are two types of people in this world. There are those who take themselves seriously and those who take their job seriously. Avoid the former and copy the latter. Okay? So I do serious business, but I don't have to be serious all of the time. So if there's some stuff in here that's inappropriate, I apologize from the start. I hope it's not. <laughs> um, so th th there'll be no jokes about Canada, honestly, about Canada and the length of this place and the size of it is just absurd. Um, you've got too much land and we don't have enough. You should be giving us some of this back. <laughs> and, and there are so many Scots. Everyone I've met has a relative in Scotland. But nobody, thankfully, has said, do you know? <laughs> so, so thank you for that. Okay, I'm from the Violence Reduction Unit. Violence is my thing. Well, violence reduction is my thing. Um, you'll note, first of all, that well, I'm not about violent crime. I'm about violence. We're interested in violence from bullying to suicide. Suicide is self-directed violence. It's a way of dealing with a challenge using violence. For every homicide, well, sorry, in Scotland, we, we have murders because we say murder much better than we say homicide. Um, for every murder we have, there'll be eight suicides. So it's not about the crime, it's about the violence. Domestic violence and violence against women. We don't fix that, we will never fix violence. Absolutely never fix it. So a woman will be the victim of domestic abuse 34 times before she finds the courage to step out of that and report it to the police. Does that mean we're not interested in the, the 34th or the 33 times? That's absurd. So the idea that we should just be dealing with crime, it's reported, and the idea we should just be dealing with offenders, is absurd, and you're missing the point. I'm going to teach you a new word. It's called feckless. Feckless means totally inept. It means you can't deal with things. So the people that we lock up are feckless and stupid, in the main. So we need to do something about that. They're sins ignorance. So the good news is we can fix that. That's about education and changing the way we are. So I will go through this. I, I'm, I'm going to stay in the move as well because it'll make Jeff a bit worried about how I'm going to see the cards when I've got to stop speaking. <laughs> and the only bit of advice I would say to you, Jeff, is 
you shouldn't be concerned if you're chosen because you look good. I would just enjoy the moment. <laughs> I wish I had been chosen to do something because I look good, but sadly it's never been the case, you know. Despite my best efforts, we'll need to work out how this works now, which will probably be the wrong way around. I don't really need these. They're only for seeing. Um, so what, what we'll try and do is some context. So I'm going to speak about violence and, and frame the context around violence. That's the, the Trojan horse. But it will apply, I hope, hopefully, to other things. Maybe the simplest way to look at it and how it might look, if you think about drugs and, and illegal drugs, um, not alcohol, but illegal drugs, we, we've spent a lot of time in, in the UK and elsewhere on interdiction and actually stopping drugs getting into the country on the supply end. You know, we spend 95% of the resources on drugs at that end of it. Now, we're an island. We don't grow poppies there. We don't grow cocoa there, and yet we have cocaine and heroin and stacks of it. So we've done nothing about the demand end. And we can do something about the demand end as well. Because some kids know how to say no. So how is it we know that? So we need, we need to work in that. So that's, that's where we're coming from. Then that notion it's a wicked problem. The public health thing, because the, 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 my colleague Otto, if, if I may, you're absolutely right. Health is an issue, absolute issue. Healthy communities, resilient communities. And the language is sometimes clumsy. We, shouldn't, we should be able to be big enough to get by that and say this is what it's about, this is what we mean by this. And I'll tell you a story about a boy called David and then some of the, the challenges that, that we face. Um, policing is a service of last resort. The time it comes to us, it's broke. Yeah. So it's that idea in terms of prevention that if people kept falling off a cliff, what police do is they work out when they're going to fall off. We get an ambulance down the bottom of the cliff. We find the best road to get to the hospital. We make sure we've got good orthopedic surgeons in the place ready to do it. We might have a four before truck because it's steep to get up from where they fall off. Where someone from public health would say, why don't you just put a fence up and a big sign saying watch the edge of the cliff? And we haven't done that. And that's what we can do. We can do all the stuff at the bottom of the cliff. But you guys need to be working at the top of the cliff. Our job is to stabilize the patient. It comes to us, it's broke. And, and even the best police force is not going to fix the challenges that are there. All the determinants around violence are social. So we need to work out how we're, how we're going to do that. So we work away at that top end, chipping away at the iceberg. That's the bit that we work on, the bit at the very top. But it doesn't make a blind bit of difference to the size of the iceberg. It just bobs up a little every time. If you want to change and shrink that iceberg, you need to raise the temperature of the water. And that's about big things. That's about equality. That's about gender equality. That's about alcohol. That's about consumerism. We live in a world that values commodity above community, where young people are bombarded with things to do it, bombarded with what it's like to be, what you should look like as a young woman, what you should do as a young woman, what a man should do. We're bombarded with that, and that's the stuff that we're working against. So while we work away at the top end, we need to be thinking about the temperature of the water stuff as well. It's really important. We've been fixated with the things that make us ill and not the things that make us healthy. I hope, Otto, when you start to see all these healthy things in here, you'll maybe be reassured that... We need to think about the things that create health, not the things that make us unhealthy, because we tend to think about that all the time. We tend to focus on those individuals who are having a real problem and troubled. We need to look at the ones who are not and learn why they're not to help us help the guys and girls who are troubled and troublesome. That's what we need to do. So, it's a wicked problem, which is Rittle and Weber, your academics will probably know about this one. There's no clear definition of a wicked problem. We can make wicked problems better, or we can make them worse. And from a health perspective, we need to be careful we don't make things worse, because poorly judged intervention can make things worse. So we need to be careful about what we're doing. It's never that clear when we've got them fixed. And every attempt to fix it changes it. So this idea that, so, sorry, this idea that there is a problem that we've defined and diagnosed, that we find a solution and we apply it, and that's it, fixed, and we walk away and it's done. I'm sorry, folks, that's not the world we're going to be living in. We will change the problem, but there will still be one there. This is the way it's meant to be. We're evolutionary. We change. 
One of the examples, for instance, is in Scotland. We've been very effective at policing that front end of it. Stopped and searched 300,000 people in Strathclyde last year. With the lowest crime levels and uh, violence levels for 35 years. Homicides on a trajectory now on its sixth year where it's, it's, it's continued to go down, although last year there was a little bit of a, a blip. Um, so, what's happened with violence because of our policing is, and not just policing, it's shifted from, indoor, uh, from outdoors to indoors. So you need to keep diagnosing the problem. You need to nuance the issue. There's no point looking at crime stats and saying, well, the, I see violence is up in Saskatchewan 2%. That tells nobody nothing. It needs to be about what it's about. It's nuanced, and we need to understand that. It's about a doctor. A doctor wouldn't say to you, well, you've got cancer. What kind? I really don't know. You've just got cancer. But why would you do that? So you need to understand what it's about. You need to understand the detail. So ours has shifted inside. And there are a few reasons why we think that's happening. Number one, bloody good policing. Number two, smoking ban. Number three, alcohol's far cheaper in an off-sales in a supermarket than it is in a public house, in a, in a pub. And there's fewer restraints. Sky television, cable TV, northern European weather. There's a whole reason why this is there. Now, if we've got more fights happening indoors at parties, and I don't mean domestic violence, but happening at parties and stuff, how do we police that? How do you put, do you, do you, if you buy a certain amount of drink, you get a free police officer to stand in your hallway with a yellow jacket on? We don't. We have to think of other ways of doing that. And that's, what, that's currently the problem. So we've changed the problem a little, and now we're having to, to deal with that change. So we'll always be like that. So it's never going to be fixed. And the other thing as well about violence and criminal justice is, it seems to me that the only time people are satisfied with anything is if it's zero. People are not satisfied if someone's offending behaviour reduces by 50%. What they'll say is, oh, he's still offending. Well, 50% reduction is a result. It has to be. So we need to think about that. So violence is a, interpersonal violence is a public health issue. It's not a crime issue. It's a public health issue, yeah, and that's Etienne Krug, Director of World Health. When we found this, Karen McCluskey and I, Karen's my co-director. A um, couple of things about Karen, one, she's far more attractive than I am. She's got fabulous shoes, and she's got the brain the size of Belgium. Um, she's a forensic psychologist, and as bright as a button, we call her Sparky, and, and you would, you know, you, you would, if you ever get a chance in Scotland to, to meet Karen, you should uh, actually take it. Because we were thinking when we found this, Good, we can give it to health, they'll deal with it, you know. But they weren't, they weren't terribly enthusiastic about the plan. Um, <laughs> so we, we, we still have it, but we, we work on. So what is it about? Well, first of all, it's about understanding the scale of the problem. Imagine, imagine for instance, that, that, that um, in health context, Lord Crompton, who was tasked with doing something about TB, and they said to, to him, go and fix TB. And he said, right, I'll use that, that, that criminal justice model. So we'll wait until someone gets TB. We'll wait until they come along and tell us about it. Then we'll diagnose it and we'll put them in a sanatorium. And if they get better, we'll let them out. And if they don't, what are you going to do? That's what we do with young men who are violent. That's what we do with violence. We wait until it's reported to us. We do something about it. We put them in a jail. We leave them in a jail. They come back out. They commit a bit of violence, we arrest them, we put them in a jail, they come back out, they do a bit of... But what Lord Crompton did, which was really smart, he said, maybe that's not the thing to do. So what they do is, in health, what's the size of the problem? What's the scale of the problem? Let's diagnose the problem. So we look at the scale of it. We understand what impacts on it and what causes it. If we understand the causes, we can start to reduce the risk and increase the protection. Alcohol, for instance. Limit access to alcohol, you limit violence. You will. Limit access to firearms, you limit murders. You will. Just fact, you will. Then once you've tested these things out and evaluated what you're doing, and you need to evaluate the stuff you're doing, then you scale it up. So you do it whatever you can. So some of the stuff you're doing here that I've seen over the past few days is just outstanding. I'm really, really, um, there's a part of me that's really happy to have played some part in the work that Dale's done and, and the hub. The other part of me is really teed off that you've actually moved it to the next level, that it's somewhere else and we're now behind. So we need to catch up, and I will be catching up, believe you me. Um, 
we'll be doing something entirely different very shortly. Um, so so that, there's that stuff that it's there, it's always shifting and we always need to be adaptive. It's that diagnosis. Doctor doesn't diagnose you in day one and say that's it fixed. You go back six months later with something different and they say, oh, that, we diagnosed you six months ago. What are you doing back here? We always need to stay on top of that. And that's about good information, good baselines, good statistics. Not the statistics that say that's crime up by 2%, but really good, nuanced statistics that make sense to us so we understand what the problem is. Pressing the wrong button again. Um, there's probably something happening somewhere when I'm pressing this button that I don't know about. Um, oh, there you go. So we need to identify the risk and protective factors. And then once we do that, we can say, so alcohol, reduce access to alcohol. That will make a difference. We need to develop and evaluate interventions and interventions that work. And, and I should say as well with, with the injury surveillance, that's, that's, that's the reported crime stuff. We know that in hospitals in the UK, not just Scotland, but throughout the UK, and I would suspect it won't be far out here, only between a third and a half of people who turn up at an A&E as a result of a violent incident will report it to the police. And they don't report it because they're going to do it themselves, fix it themselves, more violence. They don't report it because they're too afraid, more violence. They don't report it because they don't think we can do anything about it. What does that say about communities' confidence and well-being? So we need to raise that up. So for the politicians, we have to say, you think it's bad? It's actually three times worse. Now that's not something that they're terribly enthusiastic about. But however, for professionals, we don't need to play the front newspaper stats game. We need, to, we need good evidence. We need good evidence that's there. We think there are two elements to, to violence. The first is an in individual's propensity to be violent, and the second are the social triggers that kick that off, the bomb and the trigger, if you like. So what we've done over the years is we've concentrated a lot on this end of the business. So we've got new legislation. It was interesting when Gerald was speaking about what politicians can do. I always think they can do two things. Spend money, make laws. And they're not keen on the first one. So you get lots of laws, certainly in the UK. We made antisocial behaviour illegal. It's still there. But what politicians can now say is, don't tell me about it, I made it illegal, speak to the police. In a rugby terminology, we just caught the man and the ball, you know, at the same time. So we need to be careful about that. We've done very little about the personal stuff. That's been a Rubicon we've never been prepared to cross. Well, I think we have crossed it now because we need to start thinking about these things. It's a science, it's not a notion. So, right button here. So this is the story of, of David. Um, I'll tell you David's story first and then we'll come at the end. We, we um, pulled this together, uh, uh, Karen and I, because we were asked to go and speak to um, the cabinet at, at, at Scottish Parliament. And um, they said, you've got 15 minutes. So right, okay, fine. Um, I don't know if that's to do with the attention span, but anyway, we, they, had they had 15 minutes. We, we were there longer than that, we just refused to go. Um, so we stayed longer because it was too important. But this is, this is David's life story. Now this is not a made up story. This is a, this is a true story of a, a young man. You judge, um, you judge uh, if it has relevance for you. Um, David's born in 1981, his mum's an alcoholic and lives in income support. Um, so fetal life would have been challenging for, for David. I should say as well that when Gerald said he, he learns about things, I may use a phrase called emerging evidence. What I actually mean by that is I've just found out about it. So, so you may say, we've known about that for years. Well, I'm sorry, it's maybe just something I've just found out about. So that's, that's David, born in March 1981. They live in Easter House, which is the 19th most deprived ward in, in, in Scotland. The ward's a, 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 an electoral area. It's the size of, a, I think it's about 5,000. Before he's three, they move because of domestic violence and he's housed and rehomed to Milton, which is the 17th most deprived ward in, in Scotland. Then he attends the nursery school, he attends the primary school, he's rehoused again to the ninth most deprived ward because of ongoing domestic violence. This is his dad, okay, it's his dad. The family are moved to Easter House. He moves in with his maternal grandmother because his mum can't cope. This is his granny and this is the family. They're wholly workless, a wholly workless household. There are three uncles in the house, adult uncles, with 120 previous convictions between them, from drugs to robbery to, to, to knives to, the, to, to everything. We put David in here because we thought it was better than where he was. This was better than where he was. Um, 
I should say as well, we've since tracked down, last October we, tr we tracked these, uh, the, the, the uncles again. The, sorry, there are four there, but we could never find a trace of this guy. We don't know what happened to him, which is a bit of a concern as a murder investigator, but anyway, we couldn't find him. So I thought we'd better not ask too many questions, so um, keep the stats right, as they say. Um, two, of those, two of the uncles are dead. Alcohol-related stuff. We have four times as many men dying in Scotland in this decade of alcohol-related illness than in the 1980s, and three times as many women. There are men and women turning up in their late teens and early 20s with sclerosis. That's something that was reserved for 40-year-olds and 45-year-olds not so very long ago. There's something happening. And what's happening is that um, we're commercialising alcohol to such an extent and making it available to such an extent, people are just um, getting caught out with it. This is where he lived. It's um, an Easter house. It's six in a block, controlled entry, double glazing. It's, the houses are fine. The family are rehoused again due to domestic violence. This is a new partner, just in case you thought there was only one domestic abuser in Glasgow. Um, he's rehoused again due to local authority plans for demolition and regeneration. Rehoused again due to local authority plans for demolition and regeneration. Rehoused again due to local authority plans for demolition and regeneration. We're big on regeneration. We're actually big in building houses. Sorry. Regeneration. Uh, yeah, those are quick. Rehoused because we were knocking the houses down to build new houses for them. Regeneration. I'm sorry. A timely reminder, though. A timely reminder. We forget when we're doing regeneration that people are here. We're doing nothing to regenerate people. So we'll have wonderful waterfronts and five-star hotels and conference centres and fabulous hotels. But we need to remember there's people who actually live here. So we need to remember what they're about, and that's important. Then he starts St. Leonard's Secondary School. We spoke to his head teacher. He remembered him. He remembers him as being diminutive. That's his fetal life. It's very small, diminutive. Lots of young men in Glasgow are like that. Don't mistake that as, as um, meaning you can take them. <laughs> because... <laughs> They're, they're small, but, but game. <laughs> he starts to get involved in gang rivalry. He's a truant. He's out with parental control. This is the area he lives in, which is the um, east end of Glasgow. These are gang territories. Up until five years ago, we had no gang strategy. We waited until after the fight. We arrested the offender, feckless and stupid, and he got offender services. We picked up the victim, he went to hospital and he got victim services. The day before, it was around the other way. And their issues are exactly the same, victims and offenders. It's the services that are set up differently. So we need to think about that as well. Um, we since introduced a, 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 an intervention program founded, a, a, and Hirsch mentioned it earlier, Cincinnati. Um, based on the work of David Kennedy and Gary Slutkin, um, like the Boston ceasefire. We brought that over from Boston, uh, from uh, uh, Cincinnati, applied it over here, tied a ribbon on it, tartan ribbon, and um, <laughs> over two years, violent offending in that area of the 400 young men who are engaged with us is down by 53%. 53%. Um, and when people say it is, when we brought it over at first, yeah, this is Glasgow. We are not like the boys in Cincinnati. They're, they're black African Americans. We're white Scots. We're different. We're not that different. We're absolutely not that different. Same issues. So, he moves to Easter House. This is Easter House. It's the other side of the road. These are all gangs. These are the gang names. Agro, Skinheads, Drummy, Den Toy, um, We've got Caltoy. Um, these gangs have been in existence for, between the wars the gangs were in existence, there's intergenerational stuff between these gangs. It's recreational violence. They're not criminal gangs, they're offending behaviours to do with alcohol and to do with um, violence, nothing else. He commits a couple of breaches of the peace, he's referred to the reporter, that's our children's prosecutor, where we deal with children founded on their need and not their deed. Um, it sounds fabulous, but 
it, it's, it's not as good as it sounds, I have to tell you. It's, it's really challenging. Reporters do a great job, as do the social workers who are there, but it's really difficult. There's a scale thing involved in it that's, that's there. Um, family are moved to uh, Easter House again. He gets done with housebreaking, he's classroom disruptive, he's excluded intermittently, he's into solvent abuse, sniffing glue, um, he's family resistant to involvement, he's done with assault, shoplifting, theft, breach of the peace, al drinks alcohol, theft of car, road traffic offences, family move again, he's 15 and a half and he kills a man. He stabbed him once in the upper torso and the man died at the scene. Now when David was at school his ambition was not to be a murderer. Nobody's ambition is to be a murderer. It's not an option. It's not an option to be an, al an alcoholic. Nobody says, who'd like to be a heroin addict and a prostitute when they grow up? We don't do that. But it happens. So we need to be thinking about where we are and, and how we intervene with that. David took a knife with him that night. He still didn't intend to murder anybody. He stabbed people before and they haven't died. He's been stabbed before and he hasn't died. He's feckless. You and I think... You stab someone in the upper torso, you're going to hit a major structure and you will do them damage. David doesn't think like that. Doesn't think like that. So stop thinking that they make the same cognitive choices that we do. They do not. They do not. Not because they deliberately don't. They cannot. They don't have the capacity to do it. But it's really interesting while that's on the screen. If you'll note, down this end, we had a an alcoholic mum in an abusive relationship who needed help. We had an alcoholic mum who was pregnant in an abusive relationship who needed help. We had a baby with an alcoholic mum and an abusive father needing help. Very little help came to him. Very little. But he came up this end and he started to annoy us. And if your only solution is a hammer, every problem's a nail. And we hammered them. We hammered them. And we're good at that. That's where we spend our money. That's what police do. There was no police officers here. There were no police officers here. So there's opportunities in David's life to have made a difference. Now, when David was sentenced for his murder, the judge said he, he, there was nothing to indicate he was anything other than a pretty ordinary teenager. Now, if that's ordinary, I'm leaving. We can't accept that as being ordinary. You wouldn't accept it for anyone in your life being ordinary. So why do we accept it for other people? We cannot have that tolerance that low. While he's in prison, his mum dies of a heroin overdose and his sister goes into secure accommodation. He participates in escorted leave and while he's out, he gets done for trying to take drugs back into the prison. He gets released in life license. When he gets released in life license, the ministers have to sign that off. And, and what they said was, Although it was written by a civil servant to give the pressure off the ministers, it was the civil servants who wrote it. It said, um, he can look forward to strong support from his grandmother and his employment prospects look favourable. So, we thought that was a bit, hmm. Um, that must be the job centre plus plus sort of thing we do, that, that careers plus plus. So, we had a look to see, because this is where we sent him back to, remember this? We sent him straight back in there. So, we had a look to see who else lived in the street. So the tourist board have said to mention to you that this is not 24 hours in a day in Glasgow. This is who lives in the street. At number six, Christopher's there. He attacked a man in 2006 with baseball bat and an axe. At number eight, there's a woman there who doesn't like the police and she carries a knife and her husband's a heroin dealer. At number 10, there's a sulfate, an amphetamine dealer and her father at number 14 makes counterfeit DVDs. At number 12, David's girlfriend. Because at 14, no matter what you are, you get issued with hormones. That's the way it works. At number 12 is John, OCG, Organised Criminal Group. That's an organised criminal group. He runs a security company and he's a drug dealer. At number 14, there's a Valium dealer. We have intelligence that our man attacked him with a machete. That wasn't reported to us. At number 15, there's a cannabis dealer. At number 11, there's an ecstasy dealer. And at number 9, there's a heroin dealer. Can you see the job prospects? <laughs> Well, you're a young man in your, in your mid-twenties. You, you, you've got a reputation for violence. You've no empathy. You ain't going to get a job. Is there anyone in here who's an employer would employ him? You wouldn't. So what do you do? Just cuddle up and think that's life over? No, he doesn't. He gets on with it because he has some skills. Look how he's been brought up. He can survive. And that's the great thing about humans. We'll adapt 
to the how, how we're brought up and where we live. And you bring a child up in a war zone, you'll create a warrior. David's a warrior, and he's good at what he does. Make no mistake about it. So, while he's out, his cousin Kevin, who lives with him, stabbed a boy in the neck with a knife, a 14-year-old, because he looked at him the wrong way. David's starting to infect those around him with his violence. His, his cousin gets arrested at a, at a commemoration march with the lock back knife on his sock. David starts work for the organized criminal group as a security guard. He attacks a man with a machete. We've got intelligence. He's dealing in heroin and cocaine. His mum's sister Rose dies of a heroin overdose. We have intelligence. He's still carrying a knife and involved in unreported assaults. October 2007, he has a baby son. That's where they live. Cycle starts again. Starts again. There's things we could have done for David. We didn't. And, and we don't give up on David. We don't give up on anybody. But make no mistake about it. There are some people we need to put in the jail. I've spent a large part of my adult life doing that, and I don't have an issue with it. So I'm not talking about an either or here. I'm talking about both. You can lock up as many people as you like. We need to lock up the people who we're scared of and not the people who annoy us. Put the right people in jail and fix the other ones. And we can do that. It just needs a bit of effort. So it's not an either or situation. So this was work that, that um, Sir Harry Burns is somebody we work with. He's the chief medical officer for Scotland really bright guy. YouTube Harry Burns and, and listen to Harry speaking. Harry's been trying to figure out why our gangs guys um, engage and how they turn around. How do we get that desistance going? And there are lots of work going on in, in criminal justice around desistance and, and what it's about. And usually it comes back to relationships, strong relationships that make the difference. But what Harry did, Harry found some work by a guy called Antonovsky. And what Antonovsky had done was look at Holocaust survivors, survivors who had survived the camps. And what he found was, as you would expect, there was a, a huge majority of survivors did not have good health. But there were some who did. So he looked at the ones who did have good health. That's that asset stuff. Let's look at the things that make us healthy and not the things that make us ill. And what he found was three things. The first one, and you'll all have this in here. First of all, that your world is structured, predictable, and explicable. You need that for good health. You have to have the internal resources to meet demands as they come to you, and you have to recognize those challenges, uh, those demands as challenges worthy of taking on. We've got young guys in prison. They don't want to come out of prison because when they come out, their lives are chaotic. They're living in stress all the time. Stressful. If you're walking down a street and don't know if somebody's going to chase you and stab you because you've been fighting with them since you were 11, it's really stressful. If you fancy a girl who lives in that community over there, you can't go there because you've been fighting them for ages. You'd like to have a job, but you have to walk through different areas and you think you'll get chased for there. That's stress that these people are living in every day of the week. That's why health is no good. So, Harry Burns, you need to check out Harry Burns. Um, so, this is, this is a, a, an ecological model, just to pull it together around violence. And, and the, you know, the individual relationship, community, societal. So, in individual terms, what we need... We've got these young guys who, who lack life skills. I actually don't like the term skills, but we'll use that for the sake of communication. There's clumsy language. The most important four years of a child's life are up to age three. That's no emerging evidence. That's there. You want the evidence? We'll order a couple of trucks and bring it in here. That's when we need to spend our money. Heckman was visiting here recently, I believe. James Heckman, Nobel laureate economist. For every pound you spend in early years to get the result, you'll need to spend seven up here. There are key moments in those early years of development and a baby, baby's born with a blank brain almost. And the synapses fire up and create happiness. They create contentment. They create problem solving. They learn to communicate, to negotiate, to compromise, to empathize. And if they don't have those skills, they can't do it. It's not that they're deliberately being there. And when mum has a brand new baby, she doesn't say, I'm going to make your life absolute hell. They don't. It's a teachable moment. When, when mum's pregnant, her principal responsibility is to create a safe environment for her baby. If she's in an abusive relationship, 
or there's aggression and stress. It doesn't even need to be violent, as in physical violence. The stress that causes there is horrific. Cortisol is a stress hormone. We need it. But it doesn't help baby when mum's producing it. It does damage to baby. Alcohol in the womb. There was a time when we thought, this is emerging evidence, a time when we thought that babies were safe in the womb. They're not. So the most important four years are up to age three. We need to see who needs support and needs help and we need to work with that. And then when baby's born and they start to develop and the synapses connect and we do things, they learn to do all this stuff. But if they're not in a good relationship, if mum can't do it, if mum can't parent, and it's not just a mum's job, but that's who's present at the time and that's why parents are important. So it's not about good or bad parenting. It's about helping parents be as good as they can be and recognising that if that's the most important time in a human's life, we need to be there to help them when, we need, when they need help. That's where we need to spend our money, there. We also need to spend it up this end. That's why it's a wicked problem. But we need to try and shift some of it down there. And that's why domestic violence is absolutely at the heart of this. If we do not fix violence against women, we will never, ever, ever fix violence. And here's the thing, guys. Violence against women is a man issue. It's not a woman's issue. Women have been fighting on the field now for the past 40 years. We need to get in and help. Somebody said today you can't be a bystander anymore. Well, you can't be a bandsider in, in violence against women. It's not enough to say, I don't assault my wife. You need to challenge things. And think about the iceberg and the temperature of the water. It's not just the physical violence. We need to challenge the language we use about women. The inappropriate language, the inappropriate jokes, the comments, the things we say, the way we talk about and to women needs to change. That's a man thing. So you can't be bystanders anymore, guys. You need to step up to the plate. So, in terms of relationship, parenting. As I said, it's not good or bad parenting, but being as good as you can be. Um, and it's really, it's really challenging. It's really difficult. If you think about parenting, in health terms, remember those protective factors. So let's say you're, you're a well-educated couple in your late 20s. You live in a nice area, you drive nice cars, you have a good income, you're well-educated, you have a wide social network and a wide supportive family network and you have a baby. It will still be a challenge. I've been married for 38 years and I've got two daughters. I've been living in a cloud of estrogen most of my life. <laughs> it's still difficult bringing up kids. So you imagine those things as protective factors and take them away. So that you're not well educated. You don't have a wide supportive family. You don't have a supportive social network. You don't live in a nice area. You're on your own. You're 16. And when you're pregnant, what we do is we put you in one of the worst houses we can because we can't let it to anybody else. And we give you a forward-facing buggy. Forward-facing buggies is a whole other lecture. They should be facing towards you and not away from you. Because they need to learn. Anyway, so we need to think about that. It's really important, absolutely at the, at the heart of that. And I think that the domestic abuse part is the part where... I'm really having trouble with these buttons. There's only two of them, too, which is really <laughs> disconcerting. In the office, they say I'm a digital immigrant. Um, tolerance. We need, to, we need to change our tolerance and our acceptance of things. It's not enough to, to do that. Um, in the east end of Glasgow with the gangs, I got a phone call from a chief inspector who said, boss, that gang stuff's working really well. I said, yeah, we've got some of the stats back. He said, no, 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 no. We got a complaint yesterday, he said, about dog fouling. Now, that's important. There was a time in those communities where they didn't even report gang fighting because it was normal. That's what happened. We can't do anything about it. Now we've lowered the tolerance to the level where they're saying, gang fighting stop. What the hell are you doing about this dog fouling? That's a good thing. That's a good thing. It's just, I'm not sure if there's any MBAs, MBA junkies. How do you fit that into your KPIs and your plans? Anyway, I'd be interested. That's a serious question. <laughs> Inequality, and we spoke about that at the start. The, the societies where there is least violence are most equal. The societies where there is most violence are most unequal. That's, it's there. So we need to, we need to fix that. This is, um, when we are talking earlier, after last night, this is, this is the framework that we work in in Scotland. This is Scotland's strategic aims. We want to be wealthier and fairer, safer and stronger, greener and healthier, uh, and smarter. The, uh, um, I think if you were, you know, Ritters, you'd be talking about, a, what is it, an, an order-generating rule. Um, we've got 16 national outcomes, 
and we have got 50 indicators. The indicators are like, we need to re reduce victimization by 2%. So every local authority buys into these, there's 32 of them, and they give them the money and say, we don't care what you do, you need to do it in your own area, but this is the, this is the stuff you need, to be, you need to be working on. I got that around the wrong way again. No, I haven't. Now these, these are all the strategies we have and, and all the policies, right? Now, I'm not a big guy for strategies and policies. Um, in the office now, we actually measure strategies and policies in centimetres. Is it any good? Three centimetres, boss, it's a really good one. It'll hold open the big door. <laughs> because it, it's, it's not about that. that that's our 10-year strategic plan for violence. And it's big print. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Because we're doing the right things. These are the titles. Look, you know, valuing our young people. Curriculum for excellence. That's the education one. And in that is resilience and well-being. So we can speak about young people, to young people, about resilience and health and well-being. Girfek, get it right for every child. Well, why the hell wouldn't we? We need to write a policy to get it right for every child. Mm, that's a worry. But we're doing it. Um, all of these things are the right area. More choices, more chances. The early years framework, an early years minister. But the point I want to make is, those strategies and policies will change nothing. It's people, it's relationships that change things, not policies. So when we look to the leaders, as, as Hirsch mentioned earlier, you know this, the leader to lead us out of trouble. No, we don't, we're our own leaders. We need to do things from the ground up. So the strategies are fine, but they ain't gonna fix it. I'm going the wrong way again. So some of the challenges we have, I, I, I'll be two minutes and I'll, you know, I'm getting we need leaders, not technicians. Investigating a murder is a technical skill. I tell you, I, I'm sorry for the, any detectives or murder investigators in the, in the audience. Here's the secret. It's dead easy. We've got a detection rate of 98 point something percent. The feckless and the stupid. It's straightforward. Make us look good. See that CSI stuff? <laughs> they normally hand themselves in after a couple of days. Um, Command and control, we can't always have that command and control. You know the guy, you know, here's the, here's the leader. He's got a plan or she's got a plan. She'll tell us what to do and if we obey the plan and follow the rules, everything will work. <laughs> no, it won't. We've tried all that stuff. We are where we are. It won't work like that. It needs to be far more adaptive. It needs to be local. So you need good diagnosis of what's the issue locally and what can we do. Professional gangs. Karen and I have got a whole presentation on professional gangs. So we could do the gangs talk about the East End of Glasgow, or we could do the gangs talk about health, education, social work, police, um, national, local. And those gangs are more territorial, more corrosive, more pernicious, more dangerous than the street gangs. So we need to make sure we are not part of that territorial gang. We need to make sure that we work together to do that. It needs to be about outcomes, and that's what helps the gang stuff. Not about the processes, not that, well, this is what we do and this is how we do it. It's the, the you probably do surveys in communities. We do it back home and, and sometimes they're great. It'll have a question that they send out to people. I've had them through my door and it says, do you think our services are great, wonderful or terrific? <laughs> and we literally do that stuff. We turn up to people and say, here are the services we have. Would you like to choose one? Well, none of them actually suit. It's all right. We, we need to design services that suit the issues and, 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 and the needs of people that are there and add value to people in communities. Know, this, know the services that suit us. We need to do it with people and for people and not to people. People affected by the outcome must be involved in the process. Absolutely must. And can I say to you, I, I've, been, I've done more miles than Richard Branson this week with RCMP and I've been all over the place. That's the one thing that's been really, well, there's been several, but that's been really impressive. The number of community leaders and community members who are actually at these meetings and listening in. So you guys, I reckon, are just ready to push this over and, and make it really, really smart. Um, and we need to work in the assets and not the deficits. This was some stuff that we, we, we were talking a bit about this last night, understanding where we spend our money and the effect it might have. Because there's only one public purse. So if we reduce the number of knives in the street, health benefit, because orthopedic lists will get shorter because they're not having to stitch up young men who were stabbed or, or hit. If health have a good alcohol strategy, then we'll have a better time in policing because there'll be fewer people, hopefully, drunk and getting into trouble. So there's a connection, and there's only one public purse. 
There's no a health purse or a police purse or a one public purse. I mean, when I look at my, my, my salary, which is a pittance, but when I look at it, it doesn't say, you know, here's the 40% tax, but we're sending 2% to health and 3% to education. It just says, give me your money. So there's one public purse, so we should pay attention to that. This is how you'll make it work, I think. Now, these are personal views. They may not, uh, you know, you may have something entirely different. They all may have something entirely different. You need the right people, resilient, committed, and supported. People. You need pragmatic information sharing. People share information. No organizations. People. You need the coordinated approach. The hub. I hate speaking about that again. Because um, <laughs> it's working so well. But, but that, that, that makes sense. That's the thing to do. You need access to programs and services for these young guys and, and for everyone who needs it, whether it's alcohol services, drug addiction services, whether it's health services, whether it's uh, anger management, conflict resolution, no matter what it may be, that's what you need. This is for Scotland. You may be different here, but there's enough Calvin genes in the room, I'm sure. We need to aspire to build cathedrals and no garden sheds. If you're going to do it, bloody do it. And if you're going to fail, fail spectacularly, but don't make it worse. We need to have a go at it. Um, I, it's difficult, really difficult to do. But when you're talking about the connections here, I can tell you, people are on the same journey all over the place, arriving at the same conclusions. That what we've been doing is not delivering what we want. We can't keep doing this. It's not about money. It's not about anything other than we can do this better. We can make life better for lots and lots of people. And it's difficult, you need resilience, and it'll take you some time. But there's loads of folk in the journey, so I have nothing else to say. Thank you very much for your time.